Hello, everyone. Good to see you again. My name is Daniel Stecher, Vice President of Airline Operations, IBS Software, and it's a big, big honor to have you all with us today. Ladies Beyond Flying, the 13th Aviation Women Panel. Um, it all started a year ago with the first session on July 8th uh, during the IBS Software Virtual Ops 2020 uh, season. And uh, I think it was a great decision we took in September to continue. And I believe today we are going to have the largest aviation women panel ever because I think 23 ladies beyond flying have signed in. Today we have a very special session because the very first time that ladies beyond uh, flying members are going to make a presentation. And uh, before we uh, come to that, uh, just some uh, information. So today we have a sustainability in aviation presentation from Sophie and Sharina. That's our focus topic today. And also some news uh, how we are growing. We are meanwhile 436 members. Uh, last aviation women panel, we were at 411. So we have a small exponential growth. Um, I think we can still do better. Next milestone shall be the 500 member stage. So please kindly do the needful, as we all say, working for an Indian company in order to spread the word. Uh, we are not going to make an uh, introduction because I think we are jumping right into the topic. And uh, Jana, if you can mute yourself, because if you... If you move your headset, it makes some scratch noises, I believe. No problem. Now it's better. Um, I suggest Sharina and Sophie, you jump into the session. And then uh, as we engage with everybody, can raise hand if you have comment, question, and so on. That's always an opportunity that you can introduce yourself and tell the other group members who you are, where are you coming from, which location, and uh, why you are with Ladies Beyond Flight. So, Sharina, Sophie, stage is yours. Thank you, Daniel. I hope you can hear me and you can also see my screen. I hope. All yeah. is visible, yes. Okay, great. I'll just minimize this so that I'm not there. Uh, I'm kidding. Uh, but, uh, yeah, welcome, everybody. Um, so, good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever in the world you are. Um, my name is Sharina. Uh, I'm from Emirates. I work in the IT uh, group IT department of Emirates. And um, Sophie is from Air France and she works in the taxation side. And um, while we are covering the topic of sustainability in the aviation industry today, just wanted to tell you guys up front that we are not experts. Neither, neither do we work on uh, environment sustainability in our respective uh, companies. Our opinions are more from um, an awareness perspective and an enthusiastic uh, perspective. Uh, and I also have um, somebody who had uh, helped me with the slides earlier. I have Bijini from Oracle in the audience, and she's also joining us um, because she's also interested uh, in this topic. And as I said, had worked on the slides with me before on some of the slides. So this is more of a knowledge sharing session so that you take away the basics of sustainability if you're new to the topic at all, or and I'm sure some of us uh, um, already know about it. And um, we have a fair bit to cover today. So I'll um, make um, it, go to the slides as quickly as I can, because I want to hand over to Sophie, who has some uh, real industry examples to share with us today. And uh, from a questions perspective, it would be great if you post your questions in the chat uh, or note down your questions towards the end and we can go through all of it. So as I said, we've got a fair bit to cover today. So I want to get to that uh, before we go into questions, if you don't mind. Yeah. OK, we make a start. OK, so first of all, what is climate change? Yeah, so. There are greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. They are natural greenhouse gases that are already there and it sustains life because it keeps the planet warm. So from a um, natural gases point of view, what we have is water vapor in the air, carbon dioxide is already in the air. But what is happening is man activities or human activities are um, causing carbon dioxide and methane and nitrous oxide and other gases to be released to the air. So it's, for example, it's from cars, or it could be from factories, for example. Yeah. And what is happening is that when there is radiation from the sun, the solar radiation, 
and the additional greenhouse gases are trapping some of this radiation and less of the radiation is passing back through the atmosphere and it is causing an enhanced uh, greenhouse effect and it is actually contributing to uh, keeping the planet warmer than it has been before. Yeah? So greenhouse gases are contributing to climate change and this is not the only contributor to climate change and the earth is complex, but uh, it contributes to climate change by trapping heat. And what some of these greenhouse gases are also not very good for health. So it causes air, air pollution, there is smog in the air, so to speak. And much of these uh, greenhouse gases, these have um, a lifetime. So once it's released, it's not like it goes away in a few seconds, they stay in the atmosphere for uh, a various number of years. And each of these gases have got different atmospheric lifetimes. For example, CO2 uh, lives in the atmosphere for 50 to 200 years. Yeah, and what climate change causes is heat waves, loss of sea ice, and accelerated sea level rise. So what you see in the picture below is that for, during the industrial age, greenhouse gases have increased in the atmosphere over time. Yeah, and it is at an all-time high now. And what you see on the right is that well, how much the temperature of the Earth has increased in the last 50 years. Okay. And I want to touch upon the Paris Agreement. You hear this a lot. And what pa the Paris Agreement is, is a legally binding international treaty in which countries around the world have come together to combat uh, climate change. And it works on a five-year cycle. And what the countries have is they, they are supposed to have a climate action and they share best practices. And they um, take stock every five years to see what is the progress that has been made and course correct. And what has, has to be done is to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, but also build resilience um, to adapt to the impact of the rising temperature, because all, it's already here. Uh, it's not that it's something to be coming in the future, it's already here. So, so one of the first tenants is to um, limit the average global temperature increase to less than two degrees centigrade, and by mid-century, by 2050, achieve net zero emissions. Okay. And because, as I said, um, the, the increase in temperatures is already here, enhance the resilience of countries uh, to adapt to the, to the impacts that are certain to occur. And um, because of this, uh, this is such a big thing. So the, the kind of investment that is required is capital intensive. So the, the financial flows of the world has to be readjusted for this purpose. OK, so these are the tenets of the, the Paris Climate Agreement. And most of the countries have signed up. And um, what um, Paris Climate Agreement mostly looks at are domestic emissions of uh, countries, if I'm not mistaken. And some of the international emissions do not come under the purview of that, if I'm not mistaken. I need to probably read up myself on this. And while we have looked at climate change, now let's have a brief look at the aviation industry. And what is the aviation industry? Like if in what Emirates would say, it's a true connector of people, places, and economies. So it, it connects our world. It's not here to, it's here to stay. It's not going to go away. The industry efficiently and rapidly moves people. It opens economic opportunities. It transports food and goods all over our planet. Yeah. So it's a useful industry and it helps people. It promotes a global understanding. We understand each other's culture. And therefore, we, um, the industry contributes to a peaceful coexistence. And in, you, sh you should lo also uh, look at the sheer value of the industry. In, this is pre-pandemic. Most of the data in here is pre-pandemic because it was the, the aviation industry was on a, on a path of uh, increasing demand. And now there's a dip uh, due to um, COVID. So before the pandemic, it supported 4% of the global GDP. So it, is th it was 3.5. Five um, trillion worth uh, of in uh, economic activity, and in um, direct and indirect uh, jobs, it supported 89 uh, million, 88 million jobs around the world. Yeah, and <clears throat> now just let's just look at uh, what is the scope of CO2 emissions in aviation. So in 2019, which was the last year that we had the the peak. Um, the emissions from the aviation ind industry was 918 million metric tons. Yeah, 
And so you can look at some of the examples from various um, airlines and airline groups around the world. So if you look here, um, one airline is saying 40 um, million tons of CO2 was emitted in uh, 2019. Another airline is saying 32 million tons. Yeah, This airline group is saying 30 million tons. And this one is saying 20, uh, 10 um, million uh, tons of uh, fuel has been, uh, liters of fuel has been con um, um, consumed. And there is a factor of 3.15 um, that is applied to convert fuel to um, uh, CO2. So this means that around you know, 30, 35 million um, tons of uh, CO2 has been emitted by this airline. And, and why, where is the CO2 coming from? Because the fuel that is being burned is kerosene based. And uh, in commercial aviation, the fuels that are used like Jet A and Jet A1 are kerosene based. Yeah. And currently the CO2 emissions from only domestic flights are counted in a country's emission account. So whatever the countries have been controlling so far and trying to reduce and all of or offset or whatever has only been domestic flights but international aviation is not purview to any, any of this so far. Yeah. And the figures that I'm showing here are from the sustainability reports of uh, airlines. These are public data. It's available in the sustainability report of uh, um, airlines across the group. Another thing that you will see here is scope one and scope two and scope three. What it means is it's the main airlines emissions. Then this is their electricity or building emissions. And scope three, I think, deals with partners. Yeah, so you will see scope one, scope two here, and as well as here. So some examples from uh, these are some of the major. Uh, these are some of the biggest uh, uh, airlines. Yeah, so that that's why the numbers are so big. Now, are we the worst? Probably the not, not because aviation is only two to three percent. Um, has the share of aviation is only two to three percent of the uh, overall CO2 emissions of the world. Yeah, and but uh, the problem with us is that um, our share of CO2 emissions is support the, the percentage pie is going to increase because we don't have alternate methods of um, decarbonization. We cannot go electric tomorrow, whereas the road transport can and is already on that path. And we also have increasing demand. And more and more people will have um, when they when less when poverty is less, uh, the demand would be more. People are, um, middle um, population is going to increase, so the overall demand of aviation is uh, expected to increase. And the main thing with aviation is also that the 80% of the emissions are from long haul flights. Yeah, it's not the short haul flights. And what the key thing with long haul flights is that there is no practical alternate mode of transport. You can't get on a ship and go to the US or to go to Australia and be stuck in at sea for days or months, right? So it's not a practical uh, alternate uh, mode of transport. Uh, there's nothing else. Now, it's not that the industry has done nothing. Uh, global, um, the aircraft have become increasingly efficient over the years. This is something that the original equipment manufacturers have been working on for years. So you can see that the available seat kilometers and the revenue passenger kilometers, RPK and ASK, has increased over the years, but um, the CO2 emissions per uh, RPK have come down. Yeah. So, and the jet aircraft in service today are 80% more fuel efficient than the jets of the 60s. And aviation is also a very efficient mode of transport. It means that the occupancy of aircraft, for example, pre-COVID, was 82%. And it's much higher than other forms of transport. Yeah. And OK, so from a climate strategy point of view, what does the industry aim to uh, achieve? The industry aims to achieve net zero emissions by 2050, while still accumulating the projected passenger growth figures. Yeah, I'm sure you will have a number of questions towards the end, so we can go through them in a bit of detail. Um, but here I'm, I'm, I'm trying to cover all the basics so that then we can have that uh, conversation. Okay. So uh, what it means is that whatever emissions that are being emitted, it is offset also in some way, so that there is net zero emissions. Now let's also look at the, the pillars of the um, aviation industry's climate change strategy. So if we did nothing from, so this is by, based on 20, 2005, uh, 2010 uh, figures. If we did nothing, this is the path 
of um, emissions. Yeah, I know in um, COVID times there would be a dip uh, here. Yeah, but um, otherwise it is said to increase. Now, how can that be combated? One pillar is technology. So increase uh, or uh, improve te technology. That means um, better aircraft design and deployment of what is called as sustainable aviation fuel. So we'll come to that in a, in a bit. We have a slide on that. I'll, we'll talk, I'll take you through that in a bit more detail. The second pillar is operations. So increased um, efficiency in aircraft operation. This is flight operations by reducing the fuel that is burnt due to um, some kind of efficiency programs. Yeah. Third pillar is infrastructure, where you look at air traffic management or airport infrastructure and how that can be improved. And despite all doing all of this, it is not going to be enough. So this is where the carbon market comes in. So basically, you'll have to trade emissions. You, the person who is emitting has to trade with somebody who is doing something to capture the carbon. For example, if it could be a forestation um, program. It could be direct uh, things like in new age, things like um, uh, capturing carbon directly from the air, stuff like that. But anything uh, you would be basically trading against uh, uh, somebody who captures um, CO2 from the air. Okay. Now, we looked at climate change, we looked at the aviation industry. Uh, let's look at what is sustainability. Sustainability is um, trying to meet the needs of the present, but without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So basically, the, the needs of the children or the, the grand, your grandchildren should not be affected by the actions that you take now. Yeah, and a well-designed sustainability program for a company can increase profits by generating savings, driving growth, and reducing risks of the future. So sustainability has got three pillars or the three P's of sustainability, where economic viability is still important, but the planet is thought of. Um, there is an environmental protection angle, but there's also a people angle, which sometimes doesn't come through when we talk about sustainability. We always talk about uh, just the environmental protection or the climate change part. So, But sustainability has a people pillar as well. And it's not just people, it's also animals. Uh, yeah, any living being. Now, let's look at it from an IATA's point of view, what IATA is looking at and thinking of in sustainable aviation. So in IATA's point of view, there should be a long-term strategy. What it should ensure is a cleaner, quieter, smarter future for the industry. And um, combating um, climate change is a top priority for the industry. And the other priorities are combating wildlife trafficking. As I said, animals are also important. Um, not just people, and um, reducing noise, uh, managing waste are also the, the other top three priorities. And these four, these uh, 12 items are what IATA is looking at. So working towards these ambitious tar um, targets that we have, uh, develop SAF, which is sustainable aviation fuel, we'll talk about it a little bit more, um, build new technologies in the original aircraft manufacturing um, side, um, yeah, sorry, original equipment manufacturing side, and um, then um, offsetting the CO2 emissions with a program called Corsia. And this is for Corsia is more for airlines. And um, IATA also wants to look at how to enable voluntary carbon offsetting by the passengers as well. The um, managing of cabin waste, as I was speaking, is also important, and combating um, wildlife trafficking. Uh, I also want to look at how the local environment can be improved. It could be because of um, noise reduction. It could be because of um, better water management. So those angles are being looked at as well. And um, in these two, uh, ITA wants to help airlines in this part. So how to manage environmental sustainability, how to facilitate reporting and um, compliance. Yeah, it wants to work with airlines in this regard. As it already is working. Um, this um, penultimate item is about um, helping in the aircraft decommissioning, making it more sustainable, reusing parts, uh, making sure that when aircraft are built as well, um, the, the, the final decommissioning is also thought of and how the parts and things like that can be used in the future. And um, not uh, last but least, it's also about reaching travelers. And this is particularly important because of the flight shaming moment as well. So it is to say that 
look, we are not that bad, right? We are trying to do what we can and we don't have a lot of options. Um, we, are, we are doing things. And there is also things that uh, travelers themselves can do. All of us, like people, can do. Pack less, offset, uh, um, do offsetting in the meantime, stuff like that. Yeah. It also, therefore, uh, try, is trying to reach to um, to people a bit more. Now, let's look at SAF as well. And so, um, last two slides before I hand over to Sophie would be about SAF and Corsia. And SAF are sustainable aviation fuels. It's an advanced uh, biofuel. So it comes from plant matter. Yeah. And uh, it is certified as sustainable. And it is also certified for safety and performance. All uh, fuel that is used in passenger flights has to be certified by ASTM International for safety and performance. So that means it's already been tested. And SAF can be made from everyday waste. So cooking oils, food compost, uh, household waste or sustainable oil crops. So um, we um, are also very careful in, um, in, um, in IATA, I think, um, to make sure that um, the, the SAF uh, um, production is, uh, is really sustainable and it is not um, eating into um, uh, any production or uh, anything uh, from the, in, in local communities. Uh, it is not it is not uh, eating into the food crop um, production in local communities. That's what I wanted to say. Yeah. Um, even though SAF is the future, is seen as the future at the moment, the production volumes are very low. Um, it is still only less than 1% or even 0.1% of the, the current demand. And you saw the demand that was there. So if the, if the CO2 emissions was um, 916 million tons, Divide by three, that was the amount, that's the amount of fuel uh, that you need, needed in 2019. So why SAF? Because there is no alternate at this point of time for the industry to switch from Jet A1, um, because there is power that is given by that fuel. So even if we go electric and first um, Airbus and Boeing have, or Bombardier have to develop uh, aircraft that are electric or can use hydrogen, and even if they did, it is possibly viable for short haul and not for long haul. So that's why SAF is still important and it has a path probably till 2050 with us. Now, what is Corsia? So Corsia was, um, this was again pre-COVID. Some of the importance of Corsia has been lessened and I'll explain why. And it is an initiative by ICAO for carbon offsetting and reduction in international aviation. We talked about domestic aviation uh, being part of the country's targets and international aviation is not in the purview of anybody. OK, so that's where Corsia comes in. And what what it does is, as I said, is offsetting. So what is offsetting? Offsetting is an action by a company or an individual to compensate for admissions by financing a reduction somewhere else. Yeah. And ICAO member states are implementing Corsia to complement other initiatives, as I said. That are, um, even if all the initiatives are put together, the emissions still cannot be reduced beyond a particular degree, and that's where the carbon offsetting comes in. And Corsia requires airlines to offset any annual emissions that go above the 2019 baseline. So 2019 was supposed to be the baseline. Actually, 2019-2020, uh, um, uh, the average of that was supposed to be the baseline. But because 2020 dipped so low, the average would have dipped very low as well. Uh, if they, I think everybody has agreed to go with the 2019 baseline, but that means nobody needs to offset anything yet because nothing has increased beyond the 2019 baseline, right? But um, when the demand picks up, this will um, be more relevant. And what it aims to do is to make sure that the emissions between international flights uh, between the COSI eligible countries uh, come under the purview of uh, COSI. Um, and off how offsetting is to be done is by purchasing and cancelling um, the emission units in the carbon market. Right? And what you see, uh, this picture is probably a little bit outdated. I think it's from probably seven, eight months ago. Uh, I think more and more um, countries have now signed up. Um, I read just today that 104 countries have voluntarily signed up for Corsia. Earlier, they meant these um, countries in yellow were supposed to be exempt because due to economic reasons or because they were island nations and something like that. 
but I think even island nations are now coming on board. So, um, but um, of course, the initially is going to be voluntary. So that means everybody is setting up, uh, or has actually already set up, and was volunteered has been doing this from 2019-2020 onwards, capturing the, uh, the, the data for fuel, for example, and then computing the emissions and starting to report. And it has to be vetted by um, an ind independent uh, auditor. And uh, so there are procedures. So airlines are already in that path, especially in where the um, aviation authorities of the countries have already signed up for this. So um, as I said, this is a little bit old, but uh, the green indicates uh, states or countries that have already volunteered. The uh, blues were hesitating due to various reasons. Maybe they've come on board now and need to read up. Um, the yellows were initially exempt, but as I said, more and more countries have come on board, so it's possibly the the, um, the picture looks very different now. So that's what I had to cover, and uh, I want to now hand over to Sophie, and she's going to take us through what the European Union is doing, as well as she's got an industry example for us. Okay, thank you, Sharina. Um, that's very, very interesting and really sets the stage. Okay, so I'm going to try and go through uh, very, very quickly so that we do have time for Q&A. Um, what the European Union is proposing, so they came out with a paper on the 1st of July. The paper is going to be negotiated uh, for the next 18 to 24 months between states, so might change quite a lot. Um, Shireen, if we could have the next slide. Um, thanks. So the European Union proposal is called 55, and that's the name that's been given to the paper. Um, the objective is to have minus 55% emissions compared to 1919, uh, sorry, 1990, sorry, uh, in 2030, and in 2050 to be carbon neutral. And there, there are three, I would say, main pillars uh, that are being looked into to achieve this objective uh, for aviation. Um, the European Union proposal is not just for aviation, it's for everything, um, and it covers every aspect of our lives. Um, so it's maybe not as detailed as when, for instance, I had to deep dives into uh, the issue uh, for aviation. So uh, the first pillar is mandatory European compensation system, uh, which would be called ETD. Um, this compensation system uh, would be for intra-European flights only. That was a, a, a long discussion with IATA, I believe. Um, because uh, they want to avoid tankering, in other words, international flights um, profiting from the fact that they're outside the European Union uh, and not compensating. Um, sorry, yeah, not tankering, but not compensating their flights because they're coming in from outside the European Union and they're non-European non -European Union carriers. So this is only for intra-European carriers, whether they are uh, European or non-European carriers and it's the end of the free quotas. This means that the European Union is, is thinking of a compensation system that would di be different from Corsia. Um, this does not have, uh, I would say, full IATA support because IATA would like to push Corsia through. Um, and I expect the negotiations that will happen over the next months will look into that more deeply. The second pillar is the development and increase of sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, the mandatory use of this fuel uh, would be only for intra-European flights. And this is where the tankering comes in to avoid um, having flights that leave the EU and uh, fill up with different fuel, cheaper fuel, and then come back uh, and do flights, um, well, proposed flights within the EU. Um, so any European flight would have to prove, intra-European flight would have to prove that they had used uh, X amount of SAF and it would be an increasing percentage over the years. And I have not included that. The, the, the information is available on internet if you 
would like to have more detail of it. And we're also thinking of proposing more in-depth, detailed um, sessions uh, on given topics. So if you're interested, then we could dive into what exactly uh, the intent is for the increased use of SAP, but it would simply increase over the years for intra-European flights only. And then change the ETD, the Energy Taxation Directive, and end the exemption uh, for airline fuel. Uh, airline fuel today is not taxed, and there would be a progressive increase of taxes over the years for intra-European flights. Again, uh, the aim is to avoid uh, airlines fueling somewhere else. Um, and that's one of the key, key elements that uh, will be going into this uh, proposal. It's to avoid people being able to, or airlines being able to work around the proposals and avoid them. Um, here again, IATA uh, thinks, well, has suggested that it would be better to have incentives rather than mandates. But so far, the European Union is looking at having a mandate on this one. Okay, next slide. So there's an industry example. I'm going to give the example of Air France. So Air France has a sustainability department and they have um, well, created some communication slides. And I've picked a few slides within that with their permission. So this is, um, I would say, official uh, information that is available also. Um, I've to, to most people if you look for it on the internet. So what are Air France's objectives for CO2 reduction? Um, the first objective is to be and to be recognized as the leader airline in sustainable development. Um, so they're working very hard for that. They're working very hard also on their communication, which is one of the uh, factors that a lot of um, people, actors in this Field, feel that the aviation is not managing to get the message through to the customers that they are doing a lot to try and become more sustainable um, despite the appearances. Anyway, so Air France's objective is uh, was from 2005 to 2019, 6% less CO2, that's done in absolute value. In 2024, they aim at minus 50% CO2 versus 2019 on short haul flights. And, and this figure needs to be changed. This 15, it's 50%. Um, Sharina, I sent you a correction. Um, anyway, so in 2030, they're looking at minus 50% CO2. And I, I'll correct that on the slides when we send them out. Minus 50% CO2 versus 2005. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so ambitious objectives, but in fact, are pretty close to the European Union objectives. So nothing revolutionary, I would say, in the industry, but a strong desire to meet the goals that are being, I would say, promoted by um, all the stakeholders in the industry and outside it. So next slide. How are they going to do this? How is Air France going to do this, Air France? Uh, their actions that they're going to set up to reduce their carbon footprint. So first the fleet, uh, well, modernize the fleet. If you have a new aircraft with new motors, it will use less fuel, therefore it will eliminate less intermodal using the train. Now that's a, a, a national, uh, a national um, mandate uh, that uh, people should use the train if there's a, a train line that will uh, that can replace the flight and there's less than two and a half hours. So uh, Air France is actively working with the rail companies uh, in order to set up uh, intermodal flight and train um, tickets so that a passenger can buy a ticket from a given town all the way to, for instance, America with part on rail and part on an aeroplane. Um, flight operations, um, improving flight operations, so improving the flight paths, improving 
um, the way the plane is flown. I will go more into more detail in the next slide. Ground operations, uh, amongst other things, be electrifying all the equipment that uh, works on the ground around the aircraft in the airport. Obviously, a big place for sustainable aviation fuel. Um, and they're working hard on that, um, trying to set up uh, French um, French uh, factories to to cre to create uh, sustainable aviation fuel. And what's left, what cannot be replaced, and I think um, it's a given that in 2013, 2050, there will still be carbon emissions that will need to be offset. Um, they're looking at natural carbon sinks and other reductions and offsetting um, and also looking towards customers to offset their own um, carbon emissions as well. Uh, if we could have the next slide. Um, so the internally within France, there are seven priorities that have identified targets and implemented action plans. So. Uh, they're pretty similar to the previous slide, but there are a few differences. So the first one is the fleet modernization and contribution to aeronautical research. Um, in particular, motors. Um, how can we have a better motor? And also um, aircraft design. There's some nice pictures of um, V-shaped aircrafts floating around the net. Um, uh, because that would be more aerodynamic and would leave more place for, for instance, um, fuel tanks if we moved to hydrogen motors. And as far as propulsion goes, the motors, uh, motorists are looking into open pail motors. So just um, the, 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 there's just the pails and there's no structure around them. That increases the efficiency apparently um, very much. Uh, they're also looking at electrical and hydrogen engines. Um, we'll see what that ha what happens about that one. There's a, a lot of a lot of things being written about both both pros and cons. Um, and we could have another session on that, but um, I'm not going to going to go into that today. Operational message mes measures. So obviously weight reduction, route optimization. Um, optimizing the flight operators operations for instance using tools such as skybreathe so that this, it's a tool as i understand it's a tool that um, calculates how much um, co2 is emitted in fact how much fuel is being used during the flight and um, helps pilots to optimize their flight so that they are not overusing the fuel and optimizing also aircraft performance uh, for instance by um, doing engine washes. Apparently, if you wash the engines regularly, they are more efficient and use less fuel. Okay, sustainable aviation fuel, I think that Sharina has talked a lot about them, but they're also researching uh, renewable energies, other renewable energies, and supporting implementation of the Global Climate Agreement, Corsia, with a fair contribution for aviation. I suspect that with um, the European Union announcements, they will also be looking at ETS. Um, regulatory and proactive offsetting, um, specifically on short haul flights to start with, and supporting environmental programs, and uh, pushing um, the possibility to offset their carbon to customers. Um, so that customers feel happier to fly because they will not be participating in the increase in the carbon dioxide in the world since they will have been able to offset it. And next slide. So that's the end. And so we're ready for discussion and questions. And we've, we've, we've still got 20 minutes. So I think we did pretty well, Sharina. Managed to wrap that up reasonably quickly. Um, and next steps, we could suggest if there's an interest uh, to have sessions that delve into a selected topic. So it could be SAF, it could be motors, um, it could be offsetting. Uh, please bear in mind that neither myself nor Sharina are experts in the topic. Neither of us work in the sustainable department. 
Um, we both feel that this is an important topic. It's a, a topic for the future. That's why we wanted to bring it here. Um, Sharina brought along some fantastic slides and we've tried to give you an insight into, uh, well, a, a broad vision of what the topic can cover. Um, we can delve deeper, but it was not our intention during this session to make you into experts for sustainable aviation. Um, we can slowly do that all together, I think. So. Thank you very much, uh, Sharina and Sophie. I have to admit, if I'm not sitting here very fixed in my chair, I, you wouldn't see me anymore because I'm blown away from your presentation. Um, the passion and um, also all the efforts you have put into this is really amazing. And when I'm seeing also the amount of questions we have, so I suggest um, that everybody who has asked the question here in the chat notes is now um, asking it verbally. And uh, let's start with uh, Jana. You had the question on slide 12. Slide 12, okay. Um, maybe Gianna, you could repeat the question because I, exactly. I have to admit I haven't been I, because I was focusing on the presentation. I haven't been able to look at the chat questions. Yes, um, I have to go back as well and search it. Okay, slide twelve. Yes, exactly this one. Uh, could you provide more examples for these four groups that you have? Um, they are very interesting, and I would like to have more. Uh, food for thoughts or meat to the bone or whatever. Yeah. So, for example, in technology, um, it would be um, original equipment manufacturers like Airbus and Boeing working on the aircraft. Yeah. And it is also about uh, more on uh, deployment of SAF uh, as well. As I was saying later, the the uh, the production is much less, less than 1% or even 0.1%. So that means that um, the, um, the aviation industry with uh, the rest of the economies have to work towards um, setting up the production. And just setting it up is going to take some time because it is a capital intensive um, area. Yeah. So that is one area, the technology. Operations like um, Sophie gave an example, Skybreed, um, where it is an AI-based program. It looks at uh, how the flight operations and it suggests uh, areas of improvement. Okay. And so uh, it, it then allows the flight operations department of airlines to reduce the fuel burn. And infrastructure improvements, if you look at, uh, for example, in the uh, in the EU, the um, air traffic management um, control, they are looking at, Eurocontrol is looking at a lot of improvements. It is there in, in the air traffic management. So how to, when, when aircraft fly around the world, how can it be done in a more efficient man manner? And it's also to do with uh, air airport infrastructure. Does that help? I guess um, I am asking too much and maybe as uh, Sophie suggested, um, it would be a possibility for a clubhouse discussions to have really more, uh, how shall I say, more real examples. What you said I had understood also for already from the presentation, but real example like this could be done or that could be done or so. Yeah, so some of them are emerging technologies and it's things that, that are being tweaked. For example, in aircraft design, like Sophie said, there are V-shaped aircraft and there are pictures of them that Airbus has released, for example, and they're talking about how hydrogen um, could be used or electric uh, um, combustion could be used, electric uh, cells could be used. So that is an example in technology. Um, Skybreed for fuel burn, that's a real example. Eurocontrol, has, as I was saying, has got real examples. We don't have it today, but they have uh, examples of how they want to look at um, navigation systems from around the world. Carbon market is still relatively new uh, with for in the airline space. So I think uh, everybody's just learning and uh, coming together uh, still for um, carbon market. I believe you can now go to slide 16 because we have plenty of questions on the uh, SAF and um, so Lakshmi yeah. and Fatima and Anne, they have uh, all asked questions about uh, slide 16. 
just a, just a second, sorry, um, uh, Daniel, if I could just uh, say to Gianna, I, I, I think I know where you're coming from and, and we, we don't really have any proposals. There, there are proposals out there. We can deep dive into those proposals, but we, Shireen and I, don't have any proposals. We haven't done a diagnosis. We haven't looked at what exists today and we're not going to be able to do that because I, I just don't have the time. So we can we can get together material from um, various areas on the internet and we can have a discussion about it. But if we want to go further uh, and become an active working group and make proposals, um, that's that's as another step. And I think we're not ready for that. I'm, I certainly am not. That I don't know enough open, about it. Uh, yeah, that would also require expertise. For example, flight operations, you have to be an expert in the flight operations yeah. area. Uh, or you have to be an expert in navigation, and I wouldn't claim to be one. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so we, what we can do is basically pull in information that's available in those areas and what, for example, Airbus is doing, what Eurocontrol is doing, uh, what Skybreed has already done with a number of airlines, uh, stuff like that, and uh, how AI is helping. Uh, there are a number of AI-based initiatives that are helping airlines and uh, airports. Um, and, and and I think in, in this group, and this is why I was interested in broaching the subject with this group, there are people who work on, on maintenance or on uh, operations, etc. And, and those people, maybe they, they could take the subject on board and, and have um, maybe a, a better, more expert eye on, this, on the subject matter than we could. Maybe yeah. that's also a good opportunity for commercial break. Of course, IBS software is also helping airlines to minimize fuel burn by providing them with uh, aircraft routing optimization technology. So let's come to the next question, or a bunch of questions, which is really on slide 16 on the SAF. Um, so maybe, um, Lakshmi, maybe you also want to ask a question verbally. Yeah, um, yeah, Sharina. So I'll, I'll just make it really quick. So uh, why why do you think um, the airlines are not actually switching to SAF? It's because of the switch switching cost from kerosene base to the SAF, or it, it's a switching cost. Two things. So one, there is not enough production yet. Second, because yeah. of the cost as well. Um, so where um, and it, it's. You can see this more in Sweden where they've really adopted this. And uh, if you fly into Sweden as well, airlines now have the option of uplifting SAF. SAF also, mm -hmm. like one, it has to be produced. Second, it has to be put into the fuel line and airports have to be adapted to that. So there should be a way of putting SAF into the airport uh, fuel lines so that the, the um, aircraft can be then powered by SAF or otherwise the, it has to be done straight from the fuel, uh, fuel truck. And because of the price difference, uh, it could be something that airlines don't choose to do sometimes as well because of the price. Yeah, yeah you got it. Thanks. The, there's also airport infrastructure yeah, that's yeah. needed mm. and that needs to be developed. I think this uh, information from Sharina and Sophie is now uh, probably answering also questions, for example, uh, from Fatima. But speaking of Sweden, maybe Anne, you want to ask your questions um, regarding the hub issue. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I had so many questions. So actually, I'm, I'm extremely curious as to the discussion about China that I was commenting on, because, you know, I see them building airports that are so large that we've never seen anything in, in our lives. But uh, coming back to the hub, you know, it's pretty interesting, isn't it? To hub or not to hub. I think it was uh, Pedro Castro that wrote that article not that long ago. Um, we seem to be so stuck in, in, in this, you know, we're so stuck in these freedoms of, of, of the air and um, of, of not... Uh, you know, and I thought from a revenue management perspective, it's pretty interesting what I just gave as an example. We know that the via flights are cheaper than the direct flights. I mean, should there, you know, should airlines start to, could we incentivize them to, to promote filling up, you know, the, the direct flights better? I'm, I'm just, you know, I've just so, got so many questions in, in all of this. This is also better from a health perspective, of course, in, in you know, in this pandemic, it's better with the direct flight than, than the via flights. 
So just curious as to hear everyone's opinion. You know, this whole hub concept, shouldn't we have more more hubs in that case? Or should we move away sort of from, from, from the hub concept? Mm. Uh, I'm not sure whether I can comment on the hub per se. Uh, and maybe somebody else, uh, Sophie or somebody else could comment. Um, but something I wanted to say is that the fuel burn is not um, very um, straightforward, even though I did say that it is a factor of 3.15. It depends on um, um, the climb, uh, you know, the the, the descent, uh, how whole, how much you are kept in a holding pattern, for example. Yeah which might be like um, harder at the hub, whereas it might be easier at uh, an offshoot, uh, like Gatwick, you know, for example, LHR could be more packed, whereas Gatwick might uh, might not have that holding pattern. Um, uh, the, the, even the ascent, the degree of ascent makes a difference. For example, London City has got a steeper climb compared to London Heathrow. So the, the emissions from that could be much higher um, as well. So it is a complex um, top, um, topic and it's a complex area, so it might not be that straightforward. But um, overall, the long haul is where the, the emissions come, only because mainly because of the distance that is covered. Mm. And then the density of the aircraft is also important in these calculations because, uh, for example, um, um, how, how much is, uh, what is the occupancy rate because whatever fuel is being burned is being burned, yeah, um, mm. for whatever the weight is that is being carried. Now, if there is less people on board, definitely it is less uh, energy efficient, for sure. Yeah. So, efficiency yeah. rates matter as well. Um, and not only people, cargo that is on board as well. Overall weight of the aircraft in terms of whatever else has goes, goes into the back or even into the into the uh, flight deck. So that's why they uh, were looking at how, how can we reduce weight on board so that you can uh, um, then burn less fuel because you're carrying less weight. So I just want to say that much. And then um, Sophie, are you able to say something about uh, the hub point? Yeah, I, I think that um, Anne has a very good point. And um, one of the things that I, I regret, that it, it's a, something that's not talked about in Air France currently. And I, I did ask the question and I was told, oh, yes, that would be so nice if our our top management would take that on board. But it's it's um, we're talking about sustainability. But so far, we haven't talked about sobriety, being sober. Um, and some, somehow I get the feeling that if we want to um, stay under the two degree um, temperature increase, and that's, I think, everybody's goal, um, or at least that's what everybody's saying, that's what the experts say we should be trying to do, then I think it will have to go with some, sort, some form of a more sober life. And, and to come back to the hubs, I think one of the, one of the problems is that uh, most, in most um, airports, transfer flights aren't taxed. So, yeah, um, yeah it, you, you, you could end up with a flight being cheaper simply because the taxes from the first airport mm -hmm. and the last airport are lower mm -hmm. than, the, you know, than, the, than if you have a direct flight. So, yeah, I it's it's a it's a very difficult question. Um, the hub, I think, has um, well, it it, it 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 that's how airlines, traditional airlines, work. They have a hub. They have their offices yeah. in the hub. They have all their operations, their ground staff, mm -hmm. their maintenance, etc. There, yeah. and low cost don't work like that. They they have small teams in each. Well, they, they subcontract, but they, yeah. they basically they have small teams in each airport and they don't work in the same way. Um, I, I don't know if it's compatible with long haul flights um, because in Europe, which is the sector I know the best, um, it's small intra-European flights going from one provincial town to another. Um, now, would it would it work? Would that model work with a long haul flight? And is there are there enough customers? Well, I I would have said yes, but I don't know. In fact, and I noticed that nobody's doing it, so I don't know enough about the question. But definitely the taxes, yeah. Uh, I, I and it's yeah. a difficult question. Should should we should um, policy be to incentivize or should policy be yeah. to penalize? Um, yeah. Penalize. 
Um, yeah, and I think there's very, very little in, you know, we, we don't really see incentives, do we? Because we could, with incentives, we could change, I think, both attitude and willingness. Uh, the minute we penalize, um, you know, it's typically, it draws negativity, doesn't it? Uh, and people try to work around it. Yes, exactly. People try to work around it. And uh, yeah, it's, it's it's pretty interesting, this whole, you know, like you, you're saying about the, the taxation and how it works and, and all that. It's, it's, it's a fascinating area. I'm not saying that I have any, you know, it's just the stuff that you're really curious about. And, and of course, having worked in the past for a typical network um, airline, uh, well, one of them, uh, with um, um, this this craziness of of uh, much cheaper via flights, um, sort of makes you makes you start thinking about all of this. Um, but I think we're going to see. I mean, we are seeing some changes into Europe as well. Now we're going to have WestJet right flying in from 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 Canada. We're going to see long haul, low cost. We have JetBlue. We have Scoot entering Europe. I think we'll have some fascinating times ahead. Yeah. Sharina, yeah. may I suggest that you stop sh uh, sh uh, sharing the screen? Then we have more visibility on all the attendees. Yeah. Yeah, I, I put that up for the, the slides. Um, just wanted to add something. There are cases of positivity as well. Like, for example, California does a lot of um, incentivization or, um, you know, um, for especially on the SAF production. So that is why you would see um, the flights out of California do already take in a lot of SAF already. And I believe that Sweden actually gets most of its SAF actually flown in from California, which is utterly insane, considering yes. that completely it's one insane. of the, completely insane. You're considering it's one of the countries in the world with some of the largest forestry, you know, um, industry in the world and and just not to produce or buy fuel, which is ridiculous. It's 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 just ridiculous. But then again, Sweden doesn't even have a railway going into the main airports at Arlanda, something that has been neglected for 50 years. Um, the, the railway has been neglected for 50 years. So, um, you know, whenever we are mentioned as being such a, a role model, I, of course, giggle and sort of go, oh, yeah, God, it's, it's all a show, isn't it? And just words and talk, talk, talk. There's there's very little substance um, behind the scenes. Very good comment, and because Jana is already getting a bit nervous, I see you, Jana, because she <laughs> she 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 asked a very oh, she made a very good comment about a recent uh, survey in Switzerland. Uh, because Sophie, you were talking earlier about sobriety. I think we also have to talk about hypocrisy. Um, yes. Because yes. Uh, there is a lot of NATO, no action talk only. <laughs> Maybe Jana, you can ask her questions verbally again. Uh, yeah, uh, well, it's actually, um, I wanted to ask first a question on the SAF. Uh, it is, do, did you um, find out during your research how much SAF production is possible today? What is the potential today? Because I do not understand enough of how it is, how should I say, created. It's but very controversial. On, on the ones, yes, on one side, we try to reduce waste. We try to reduce this and that, and that's exactly the thing that you need to create the self. So, yeah, no, I, I, I think that uh, the sap waste is not the waste we're trying to reduce, because it's bio waste. We're not producing sap from metal, and we're not producing sap from chemicals, and we're not producing sap from you know, all, all, all this waste that we don't know what to do with and the plastic. We're not producing stuff from plastic. So, no, I, I don't think that, that, that there's, um, there's a conflict between the two. But what I do think, I, I mean, there's a lot of controversy around SAF and then people saying, experts saying that there's not enough bio waste to, to generate enough SAF for the, even the aviation industry, but we're also talking about uh, vehicles as well, and because of the, the, we're not the only industry that wants to use SAF. So um, I've heard from the airline industry, oh yes, but the other industries they have other solutions. 
um, true, but they have also their own agenda and their own problems, and they also want to use SAF. So it's no good saying, oh, well, they have other solutions. We want the 100% of the SAF ourselves just for just for the aviation but this it's very controversial it's very difficult to get an idea of how much we can really produce i mean today it's a rid ridiculous you know it's just, it's it's just one or two percent or something it's a ridiculous amount um we obviously we can ramp up but how can we how much can we really produce i i i don't know and it and i can't find anything that i feel confident to um put on a slide if everything is always I mean there's the, the people who are against the people who are for and the people who are for they're completely over optimistic and the people who are against they just ah the staff is useless no point uh, just stop just stop all the planes um, I mean some people would gladly just uh, dig a drave, grave and put all the flights in there and uh, have done with it but I don't think that's really a viable option you can't go back on progress um, so you you have to live with progress and and, and you have to find the best way for that progress to be sustainable, I, I think that that's something that everybody's got to to to, to learn to live with. Um, we're not going to be able to go back to being cavemen. I don't want to anyway. And in the interest if I of could not add, um, if I could add something, um, so yes, like you said, there's a lot of the waste, even landfill waste, that has to be ideally directed towards staff production. And I also personally think, what if, like, for example, um, road transport, they have the option of electrification. So don't use biofuels for um, road transport, deviate it to SAF instead. So you need that kind of thinking. And then for trucking, which has a problem again with electrification, go for hydrogen. So maybe each industry has to like, um, to stay with what is the best fuel that is better for them and divert more of the biofuels towards aviation would really help. But is aviation, I mean, is aviation as it exists today, and I'm not saying we have to go back, but is aviation as we know it today uh, essential? Um, you know, I, I think at some point we have to ask ourselves that question. We're going to have to make sacrifices and actually producing electricity to electrify every single vehicle today is uh, is a real challenge. And I've also read a lot of horrifying things on that about all the nuclear power plants would need to um, supply the energy for all these vehicles. So, um, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure that's, you know, is that really a viable option? I, I, I you know, it's, it's, it's really complicated. It's, it's difficult to know what we should do. I, I, yeah. But I have then another question on that because I uh, saw the last weeks a big news hype on some billionaires uh, using rockets to go to the space, and I believe the CO2 emissions for that game is potentially larger than i don't know certain airlines are producing and on the other hand nobody was complaining about it. everybody was so freaking <laughs> out oh yeah i see the one and the other and so on and uh, so it's like two flights daniel so okay <laughs> maybe we can live with that <laughs> not twice every day and every minute yeah well they but want to go into commercial but uh, what one of the um, feedbacks now or the, or the voices here in Switzerland was yes, let them go and let them stay there. <laughs> <laughs> they shouldn't come back. <laughs> but anyway, what I w wanted to share with you, we had on the 13th of June in Switzerland a votation. You might know that Switzerland is such a direct democracy that we have to really vote on nearly everything every two, three months. So. And the most of the time, the things that we have to vote on are too difficult for 98% of the people that vote anyway. So, but we had the CO2, um, how shall I say, voting, and it was denied. So more than 50%, I don't know exactly how many, let it go down. So no initiatives, everything, it was really a pullback. But the shock came afterwards because everybody is then trying to find out with which age parameter and which gender voted 
pro and cons. And the 18 to 27 age group, gender irrelevant, voted against. And then they want to they were, live. Yes, they uh, they uh, had an interviews with them and they said, I like my car. I want to drive my car. I want to fly. I want to go for a shopping experience or for a weekend shopping to New York or whatsoever. And we, a bit elder people, we were shocked because we have been attacked in the past not to do enough for the climate and attacked uh, by all this Friday uh, no school and the uh, sit downs of the young people that we don't do enough. So the 55 plus were pro and said, OK, uh, if we have to pay more for this or that or whatever charges, we take it. And then it was denied by the young people. That was a shock. And we don't know yet where we, where we will go to reach the Swiss goals of the CO2. Christine, you raised your hand on that. Oh, yeah, you want to I did. answer. I did. Yeah. Um, yeah, actually, it's good that I'm speaking now because I've gathered a few things together. And I apologize. I had to step away from the screen a couple of times. So if this was mentioned, um, I didn't hear it. Um, putting on my maintenance hat and specifically engines, um, you know, the biggest budget in an airline, unless things have changed in the last year. Uh, is it guaranteed that any engine, any motor is soft compliant, is able to take that fuel? I'm thinking possibly no, because there are still cars that are diesel versus non-diesel. We still have pumps for diesel in Canada. So that's a huge thing because um, I think with the Leap 1B, maybe like there's a couple of ones that Air Canada trialed um, uh, this type of fuel on back in like 2018, 2019. But so not only the, the, the air um, aircraft manufacturers, but also the engine manufacturers um, might need to catch up with the technology. Two, to Daniel, um, this, if you're not already putting it into your, your September sessions, sustainability seems to be an, a topic for everybody. And there are so many experts, um, you know, at Air Canada and different airlines in uh, the environmental um, uh, stability and compliance and things like that. And Anne, to you, compliance versus incentive. The world has proven to be selfish, egotistical, and lazy. They can't even get them all to wear masks. And then they can't even get them all to put them in the proper receptacle, whether it's garbage or recycling. Like we're recycling masks in Canada. I have a, a bag in my car. Every time my daughter has to wear a surgical mask to work or previously to school, goes in a bag and it's going to get properly recycled. We can't even get people to do that. So getting a, a, an airline or any company that uh, behooves, for, for whom it, it's important to actually make money to... Um, to follow one or the other, I think it'll have to be a combination of both. That's my gut feeling based on human nature and and what we've seen over the past year. Know what I mean? Um, yeah. if, if I could add, um, every airline around the world has been producing these sustainability reports and these numbers are available um, on their website. So it's something yep. that they've been tracking and they've been working on. And just on SAF, again, um, it is um, safe for um, aviation use. That's been already proven. And it is a blending fuel. It's not a 100% fuel. So it's added to the kerosene that already goes in. And um, it can be blended up to 50%. Um, so And uh, there are flights... Um, uh, that are already SAF, um, um, like in Sweden and um, in um, California, for example, that already flies with SAF on a regular basis. And adding to that, thinking about more in, uh, emerging technologies, I mean, there must be people throughout the world who are thinking, okay, the biofuel, there's not enough of it, we can't produce it, what else can we use? I mean, think about back to the future. Um, at the end of the first one, when Doc comes back and he puts garbage into the tailpipe instead of go like, Honestly, the possibilities are endless. Now, those may be outside my lifetime. I don't know. But it's pretty exciting to think that if we've gotten to biofuel and a 50 percent blend, what else is possible? You know, I, I really agree with you there, Kristen. And I think there's very, very little discussion and talk about that optimism that there's got to be ways that got to be a, a way of, of, of thinking of this as a as an opportunity and, and a challenge. And I'm, I'm not as pessimistic as you are about people's behavior because we do check 
just look at smoking, for example. We have changed almost, uh, you know, several generations of people um, into not smoking. We, we, we can we can do this. And, and uh, that I, I truly hope. But something that I totally miss in, in, in this debate is that someone told me because, you know, I'm, I've got many friends in Norway, crude oil, for example, it represents what? It represents 30 percent of the emissions total. If you were to take away six of these oil tankers uh, and actually get them out of production or move them onto some kind of sustainable fuel, um, then you literally, I, I think, you well, you cut so much that it's insane out of the total emission. Um, and, and I believe airline is like 3% of the total impact of the global emission. Uh, and nobody's talking about these oil tankers. I believe they are on international waters. They are international. Nobody seems to, to tackle that or address it. And and that's what I miss. I, I miss a couple of things in, in this debate. I, I miss optimism and talking um, science and possibilities and ways to do it differently, uh, optimism. And, and I also miss really pinpointing, you know, like I said, China represents 50 percent of the total emissions in the world. What is our com communication with them? Are they on the same page? Do they get this? Uh, do we have a dialogue between these? I mean, Sweden is, I typically say in the debate, if Sweden was eliminated and, and gone from this planet Earth tomorrow, it has zero impact. We have zero impact on that. Nothing is going to change. We are 11 million people. Nobody will even notice that we've been here and we're gone. I, dis I disagree because who <laughs> goes to IKEA? Because IKEA is from Sweden. <laughs> we have IKEA well, in IKEA France. IKEA is everywhere. They'll never yeah. disappear. Yeah, but then, and don't when worry it comes to that. optimism, I have a buttload of it. However, for the brevity of my of my comments, I wanted to reduce it to that. But then there's my comment about think of all the different technologies that probably are possible. And Daniel, oh my gosh, it would be so great to have, um, you know, someone from what uh, some or multiple of the Asian airlines in a conversation like this, because I don't know that the airlines, uh, Asian airlines would have a public discussion about this because they don't want to commit to anything. They don't want to be caught on, you know, on camera, filmed, whatever, committing to it. But having perhaps an unfilmed conversation with people from all over different places who, who are, you know, like Sharina and Sophie, they did a lot of research for this. So although they're not experts in their airlines for these um, uh, initiatives, they, it behooved them to, you know, find out a lot. So that would, I would love to have that conversation because for myself, um, yes, I'm in, in uh, ground transport logistics and we can go electric, but even at that, it's a difficult endeavor uh, based on what, I'm sorry, was it Sharina that said, so I, I apologize about, no, Sophie saying being able to fuel all the electricity for all of the cars that potentially will be manufactured, let's say in the next 10 years. So this this affects all of us and even Sweden, who even you're not going to disappear and you do have an impact. But yeah, this 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 definitely we need we need to dip back into this again, please. Thank you. So thank you. We have two minutes. Uh, Sophie, Lakshmi, you raised your hand. OK, um, so I just wanted to say um, as a final note, I mean, yeah, innovation. I absolutely agree with you, Anne. And just one of them, uh, virtual virtual traveling. I think that's something that's going to happen in the next 10 years. Um, and that's going to be a game changer for aviation. I'm not saying nobody will want to travel anymore re in reality, but people will be able to travel in a different way. And so their expectations when they actually take a plane will be different and their reasons for doing so will be different. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Lakshmi. Um, I guess one minute won't be enough for me. So I would like to thank you, Sophie and then Sharina for, uh, you know, the presentation was awesome. I mean, anyone could actually understand what really is going on in the um, aviation industry uh, regarding the sustainability aspects. And you have covered quite a lot of stuff within, you know, short period of time. I will definitely follow up with you because I have tons of questions. And
and some interesting stories uh, regarding, you know, sustainability as well, because I uh, I have some good news and then it, it was actually a diet news. But then someone from India, they actually invented a, um, a car that can be run using water. No fuel, just water. Yeah, I've heard of that. Cool. Uh, media celebrated it for like three, four days. And then the news was gone from the media all just just like that because there was huge opposition and no one was ready to actually support that invention. So it, it's not just about the technology. It's also about the support from the uh, regulations and then, um, you know, from the yeah. other businesses. So it, it's quite it's quite um, challenging. But then let's see. Um, having said that, I have also been, um, you know, a part of SS4C Friday strike for climate change and all those things. I have done that, been there. So I have no idea. Let's see how it goes. Thank you so much. No worries. Um, I saw a couple of comments uh, from uh, Bijni as well as um, uh, Vinitra. So Vinitra was asking about skills of the future. So I would um, uh, I would recommend that people uh, read more about uh, the World Economic Forum and probably subscribe to their uh, LinkedIn post so that you can see what is happening around the world, for example. And uh, Vinitra is absolutely right as well that uh, there are new skills that are required of people. So um, um, in various technologies, a lot of innovations are required uh, in this area. And like uh, Bijni was saying, um, because of the pandemic, um, what has been the impact? And like, for example, Corsia could not be, um, was not immediately uh, going to be of impact. Now it's probably relevant from 2023 20, onwards or something like that before the demand picks up again. Um, so that's also another area. But there are still airlines, airlines are still saying that sustainability is still um, something that they are interested in. So um, they are continuing to invest in other areas, for example, plastic renew, um, uh, removal from on board, for example. So there are other areas that can still be worked on and uh, that is going ahead uh, around the world. Yes. So Sharina, Sophie, thank you, thank you, thank you. It was a fantastic, amazing presentation. Um, again, I'm blown away. I think the amount of questions shows uh, that was a fantastic presentation. And I think it was just the beginning to discuss the sustainability topic further. Um, so I, I think uh, we need to discuss what will be the next focus topic on the 14th Aviation Women Panel. I was looking in my calendar and I came with the 31st of August 2021. Um, I hope that's also fitting in all your personal calendars. Um, we will coordinate the topics, uh, but again, thank you very much, Sharina, Sophie, and also all the other ladies beyond flying for the good questions and comments and thoughts. Um, it will be interesting to see the reaction also in the internet when we publish the recording. Hopefully we are attracting some Asian carriers as suggested and many more members that we are achieving our 500 members goal very soon. Until we see each other soon again, by the way, tonight at 7.15 European Central Time, we have a virtual happy hour. Everybody who wants to join, kindly do the needful. And if not, please stay healthy and safe until we see each other soon again. Bye-bye and thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye.